So we're in SWAT, Spiritual Warfare and Tactics. We're finishing up our series. But before we do that, let me, let me just tell you a little story about me. Is that all right, everybody? Okay, I grew up on Long Island, not Long Island, Long Island, New York, Mineola, and also in Garden City. And there was this pool I used to go to. It was called, it was called the Mineola Pool. What a, what a great name. And this is actually the pool. And, uh, and so I used to live in a neighborhood uh, over the railroad tracks in a nice English Tudor home. And uh, my, I used to take off in the morning after school or whatever in the morning. I, I leave at 8 o'clock in the morning. I get my Banana City bicycle with my chopper handlebars. And it was a three-speed. It was pretty cool. And I'd take off. My parents had no idea what I was doing or where I was. Right? That's how it used to be. In fact, back in those days, we didn't wear seatbelts. <laughs> <laughs> no seatbelts. And I remember being in the back of a pickup truck, going to the beach, sitting with no seatbelts, nothing. Okay? We used to eat peanut butter in school. <laughs> People are more concerned about drugs than peanut butter today. So those are the days, right? Those are the, I mean, I remember one time I would go to the uh, mall of my parents before they had shopping malls, but they had this kind of malls. And my parents would drop me off in the toy department and take off and leave me there like for an hour. And it wasn't just my parents. It was like a bunch of kids. With, with, I mean, today we would call DCF, right? And there was no cell phones, no geo-tracking. My parents had no idea where I was half the time, all the things I used to do, right? And somehow we survived. Now today, I don't know. I think sometimes I miss some of those days, especially the seatbelts. No, I'm just kidding. But anyhow, but I remember one time my friends and I, we, we get our bicycles and we go across the railroad tracks and we throw rocks at the trains. It was bad. I was bad. I was a bad guy. Okay. But at 11 years old or so, 10 or 11 years old, we go to the Mineola pool in the hot summer. And this is where they used to have the high dive to get rid of that. And I went in right in here, had my backpack, went right here to the men's changing room right over here. And I was talking to my friends, put it on, put it on. I thought I got myself dressed appropriately. And I got out, walked outside from here to out here. And this is full of chairs and people. Everyone's looking at me like this. Girls are going... I'm like, what's everyone's problem? I'm just walking around like there's no problem at all. And then I go over to here, and I dive in head first at five foot. You're not supposed to do that. This is before the days, you, this is when you could dive in the pool. Okay? And so I dove, I dove in the pool. I looked out, and I realized that I lost my trunks. I had no bathing suit on. And I was, I was freaking out, and I looked for it, and I found this little white thing. What's that? It was my fruit of the loom. I did not dress appropriately. I was talking to my friends. I wasn't paying attention. I walked out with my BVDs or Fruit of the Loom in the middle of everybody, right? So I walked out there not knowing I was not dressed to be in a pool. I was dressed to be a man at home with his family by himself with his wife. (laughs) And so I I quickly got it on. I I flagged some guy down. I knew, hey, listen, do me a favor. Go over to that chair. Get my towel. He says, what's the matter? I don't have my bathing suit. He thought it was so funny. He jumped in, got me, picked me up, and threw me. <laughs> all in all my glory. Yeah. So uh, from this day forward, I, I've been going through post-traumatic stress syndrome. How many of you have dreams about you don't have your clothes on? Am I the only worst person? Yeah. So I got, I got my towel. I got out of there. And so what happened was I was not dressed, and I didn't realize it. And I was basically naked. You know, a lot of us, we're not dressed appropriately to handle the spiritual war that we're in. A lot of us treat it very flippantly. You know, we're in a battle, whether you recognize it or not. We've been talking about spiritual armor. My question to you is, do you have your spiritual armor on? And if you don't, how do you put it on? We're going to finish up today. Are you dressed for battle? If you're not dressed for battle, you're going to be casualties, needless casualties of war will begin to happen. Spiritual warfare is real, and you are in a battle like it or not. We've been talking about this, right? We're in a battle, and there's three basic, uh, and God is stronger than the enemy for sure. Okay, make no mistake about it, that God is on, we're on the winning side. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Jesus won the decisive victory on the cross. But we're in the mopping up operations. One day he's coming back. And now we still have battles, but the decisive war has been completed. But we're still in the last section of cleaning up everything that's been done. All right, and so this is what happens. And so we fight 
from victory. We have to understand that we are in a spiritual battle and we have to prepare ourselves for the right way. The battleground is the flesh. It's the flesh, it's your hunger, it's your appetites that are not redeemed. Also, it's the world, the world system out there. If you don't recognize that you will be affected by the world, if you're not aware of the fact that you're living in a world and the secondhand smoke of the world gets on you, you even inhale it without even realizing it, unless you take preventative measures, it will affect you. And we also fight the demonic realm as well. And the primary real estate in which we fight is between our ears and our mind. The enemy knows he's a defeated foe. So what he does is he fools us to believe lies. Jesus says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the enemy knows that. So if he gets you to believe a lie, he can keep you bound up, not doing what God has called you and I to do. See, everything visible and physical precedes by something invisible and spiritual. So if you want to fix the visible and physical, you must first address the invisible and spiritual. That's for everything. If you're gonna start a business, you gotta think invisibly first, right? You gotta think invisibly first. You wanna have an invention, you think invisibly first. You wanna change your life, you gotta think invisibly first. But we should think invisibly and also pray in the spirit beforehand. If you want to have victory over your body, you want a victory over lust or any kind of situation, you want to get yourself into shape, you have to think uh, invisibly first and then it shows up physically. So the battle is won spiritually first and then you march it out. We've been talking about warfare and we talked about the Air Force, right? And so what happens there is an Air Force. And so anytime you want to occupy territory, you first got a carpet bomb. Remember shock and awe? Our military did that. We softened the target. So when you and I pray, we're part of the Air Force. Now, what we do is we're on the ground troops, but we can get on our communique and we can tell you, listen, I'm going through a heavy fire here. Would you send us some air support? And you and I can pray and ask for God's will to happen. And what happens in the spiritual realm, we have a certain amount of leeway based upon what God has given us. And you can even see in the Bible that sometimes God will seemingly change his mind through prayer. There have been situations, for example, in the Israelites turned against God and God said, I'm going to wipe them out. But this is what happened. Moses says, God blot me out of the book, but do not wipe them out. And the Bible says he changed his mind. The Ninevites, God said, I'm going to wipe you out. But they repented and changed their mind. What happened? Things changed. So you and I have an, a direct effect of what happens and what does not happen. We cannot change the character of God or the ultimate sovereignty, but we do have a role to play in our prayers if we pray or do not pray. God told Hezekiah, the king of Israel, put your affairs in order, you're going to die. He put his face to the wall and he cried out to God and the prophet came back and said, God heard your prayer. You have 15 more years. I'm telling you, my friends, prayer makes a difference. It doesn't just change you. It literally changes sometimes how God acts. You can never change God's character, but God's timing sometimes can change. And sometimes he'll even give you what you ask for when it's not good for you. He's a father. It's communication. And so what do we do? How do we fight this battle? We have to understand it's all in the spiritual first. We're gonna wrap up this whole series today on warfare. Again, we go to this finally, what? Be strong. And what? In the Lord and in the strength of his might. God, I need your strength. I was just talking to someone last service that said, you know, we have all these cute prayers, but when you're going through a hard time, that's when you really lock in. And I've been doing a lot of locking in this 2024, let me tell you. It's been an interesting year for us. A lot of, a lot of warfare in many, many different realms that I can't even share with you exactly, everything that's been going on. It's been tough. And I've had to rely upon God and say, God, I don't understand what you're doing, right? If I'd be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God. Put on how much? The whole armor, not just part of it. That you would be able to stand against the schemes of the enemy. How do we stand against the scheme of the enemy? How? By putting on some of the armor? No, by putting on all the armor. If you're going to go to war, listen, if you're going to fight, if you're going to be a football player, and you're in your bathrobe, and you have your slippers on, 
like going to Walmart, okay? <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> Have you guys been to Walmart lately? What are people wearing? Sitting there in line, this person is wearing, is it the pajama pants and a thong? I mean, like the, not, let me explain. <laughs> I mean, flip-flops, flip-flops. We used to call them thongs, okay, when I was growing up. I made a mistake. Okay. <laughs> There's a little thing you put in your toe in between. Okay. I mean, it's not appropriately dressed that way. And, and we think we can face the spiritual realm not being dressed appropriately. The Bible says if you're going to overcome the enemy, you've got to put on the full armor of God. You can't be going on the football field on the bathrobe. You have to put your helmet on, your shoulder pads, right, your cleats. You need the full armor to fight in a battle, spiritually and even in sports. So why do we do it? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. A lot of times we act like that, we act like that little boy who was in trouble with his parents, so he closed his eyes. He says, since, you can't, since I can't see you, you can't see me. No, we're in a spiritual battle, whether you like it or not. Listen, everybody, you can't see all the cell signals. You can't see the microwaves. You can't see the spiritual realm. Maybe one day we'll develop something. I don't know. Maybe the Apple will have glasses one day. I don't know. But we are the spiritual forces in heavenly places. We're in a battle. How do we fight? How do we put on the armor of God? Okay, how do we put it on? You want to know how do you put it on? Okay. Praying at all times in the spirit. That's how you put it on. Verse 18 is a summary of the, all what's going on. So what do we do? We pray on the armor of God. We're going to be talking about that today. We're going to close out praying at all times in the spirit. What does that mean with supplications and petitions? We're going to go through it today as we finish up. I want to encourage you to learn to pray on the armor of God. Let me give you an illustration. I did this for a period of time. I was going through some significant difficulties, and it was very difficult. And I, a friend told me, listen, you need, you're going to battle right now, and you need to fight. And you need to put on the whole armor of God. And he told me, he prayed with me, he said, you need to put on the armor of God. We put on the, we put on the armor by praying it on. Praying it on. Maybe some of you can get Ephesians 6 and, and read it this week. And maybe for a week, just give it a shot. A week. Just take time every day as you get dressed in the morning. Maybe you can dress yourself spiritually. And what, it's a good systems check. And you're literally saying, God, I am putting on your armor today. What does that mean? Well, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day. And having done all, stand firm, stand Sometimes all you got to do is stand. Don't give up. Don't give up. I know it's tough. I know you want to retreat, but it's always wrong to run away from the right thing. It's always right to do the right thing. Don't give up. Some of you are ready to run. Don't run. Stand. Stand in the truth. Stand for your family. Stand for your marriage. Stand for your health. Stand for your country. Stand for your church. Stand. Put your cleats in. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand the word of God. I don't care what the world does. I'm going to stand in God's truth because heaven and earth will pass away, but his word is forever. And so we continue to stand in that. Stand there for having fastened the belt of truth. And so I have to pray on the truth. Okay, there's the armament. So I'm going to pray on the truth. Lord, today I put on the belt of truth. And the belt of truth is not subjective, it's objective. There's absolute truth. There's good, there's evil, there's right, there's wrong. And Lord, today I put on truth. I'm going to believe what your word says about me, not what my thoughts and feelings and others say about me. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you. You'll never leave me or forsake me even until the end of the age. I thank you. I'm a child of God. All my sins have been forgiven. I want to thank you. I have intrinsic worth. And if you know the word of God, you pray on the truth. I choose to listen to truth today. And so when you hear that voice saying, you can't do it, no, I can do all things, right? That truth, belt of truth. And so what do you do? You pray on truth. So this, say, Lord Jesus, today I put on truth. Holy Spirit, I ask right now, I'll be filled with your truth today. I declare my whole life is going to be centered in the truth. 
because the truth will set me free, and the truth is a person. It's Jesus. And then having put on the breastplate of righteousness, what we do is we, the breastplate of righteousness is connected to the belt. And this protects your internal organs. So Lord Jesus, today, I choose to do the right thing. That's what righteousness means, doing the right thing. Lord, I choose right now, I choose to forgive that person that just insulted me at work. I choose to forgive that person that just posted something on social media, uh, and I know they're talking about me. I choose to forgive in Jesus' name. I choose not to be bitter. I choose to get better. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And what you do is you make righteous decisions. You do the right thing. You actually, okay, sh okay, mm, okay, okay. I'm not going to yell at the kids. I know the dishes are in the sink. I'm going to be cool. I'm going to calm down. I'm going to turn off the internet. <laughs> you want to drive kids crazy? Turn off the Wi-Fi and the cellular data network. You'll get their attention. Okay, just one little secret I've learned. Okay, but you put on the breastplate. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to be righteous. Righteous thoughts. Is that righteous? No, I'm not going to think about. I'm not going to think about lust. I'm not going to think about. I'm not going to entertain that in my mind about how I want to get back at that person. I'm going to be righteous. And what does this do? It protects your internal organs. Why? The heart is the wellspring of life. Protect your heart. So you pray on the breastplate of righteousness. And then having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So Lord, I put on my shoes and I stand. And Lord, I pray that where I go today, I'd bring peace. I bring peace into my workplace. Father, I bring peace into the hospital room. I bring peace into the doctor's office. Lord, thank you that I have the ability to walk on things that no one else can walk on because I have the cleats of the word of God. I have the gospel of peace. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Peace be with you. My peace I give. Thank you, Father. I have your peace. Thank you, you're the prince of peace, Lord. And listen, everybody, sometimes it's hard. But even when I'm anxious, I have peace. So I put on the gospel of peace. Am I going to walk in peace? Or I'm going to walk in peace adversarial mode trying to get in my way pray it on i take up the shield of faith lord I, and by the way the first three you keep on all the time the last three you take up when necessary father i choose to take up the shield of faith today lord thank you i thank you lord god and what is the faith faith is faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of the lord so i continue to say thank you my god will supply all of my needs you're done my god shall supply all of my needs in christ jesus I'm not good enough. God will never forgive me if I confess my sins. He's faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins. As far as the east is from the west, so he's taken my sins from me. You throw that shield up and you protect from the darts of the enemy because I have faith. I have faith in Jesus. My God will supply all of my needs. Boom! I'm gonna trust God. I'm gonna trust God. I'm gonna forgive even if it hurts. Take, so you're praying the shield of faith. You got that, everybody? Pray these things on. And it doesn't have to be long to say, Lord, I put in a belt of truth. And you pray these things and you talk about what you're going through. And so there's the shield of faith. And the shield of faith is, is made for individually and also even more powerfully when you lock in the shields with other people, which we'll get into at the end of our time here today. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. What's that all about? Well, the helmet of salvation, I know that I am saved. I have the mind of Christ in Jesus' name. I declare that my, my mind, I have the mind of Christ. Father, I put the protection on my head right now. You've not given me a spirit of fear, but peace, love, and a sound mind. Thank you, Father, that my memory's getting better as I get older. Please. Okay. So you put that, what, helmet of salvation. I'm not going to lose my head because I know God's in charge. So you put the helmet of salvation. Thank you, God. You are my salvation. You are my savior. You're the one that redeems me. So, so, which is salvation. You're the one that gives me all the power I need. I put the helmet of salvation. I am a child of God, right? I protect what I'm thinking about. Is it aligning with God? I have the helmet on. I'm not going to let fear. I'm not going to let anxiety. I'm not going to let anger. I'm not going to have lust to come upon me. I'm not going to have um, all sorts of things that are no good. All types of thoughts, getting even. Not thinking you're good enough or thinking you're all that. You put the, what? Helmet of salvation. It's who you are in Christ Jesus. 
And then the sword of the spirit. Of course, I brought it again because I enjoyed myself so much last week. And this is the word of God. This is the only offensive place we have in the armament. It protects and you, you go forward with this. Don't worry, I'm going to hit you. Okay? So this is what it is. And this is the, and what you do is you, you, Jesus said, it is written. God has not given me. It is written. You shall worship the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Boom. And you just begin to, you begin to twist that knife in whatever you're going through. That's why you need to know the word of God. And so this is hand-to-hand combat. But it's all kinds of prayer, by the way. And there's even the Roman armament. They even have this. They have a spear like this, similar to this. And they would have a, they'd have a, a short sword and they'd have this. And they would dig it in the ground. And if the enemy came, and the horses came, they would, you know, over the uh, interlocking of the shields. And also what they would do, they'd take the spear. And what you could do is you could hit targets that were farther away. So you take the spear and you throw it. Okay, so sometimes we use different types of prayers. So sometimes, it, my friends, you take the word of God and you say, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name, I thank you. That, Lord, I thank you for my child right now. And I speak against that situation in my life. And Father, I pray right now, I declare that my child is going to know God. I thank you, Father God, that this cancer, in Jesus' name, I command it to go. And you just begin to pray. And sometimes you need to throw a spear a little farther. So you just kind of throw it like this. Woke you up. Okay. So what we begin to do, right? We use, the, we use the sword and we can throw it. And, and, and what we can do, everybody, we can launch missiles far away. And this part of intercession is you and I can pray. It doesn't have to be hand-to-hand combat. Sometimes you need to throw it ahead of what's going on. So what do we do? How do we get forward? And take the helmet and the sword of spirit. And here it is. Sword and, and spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at what? Praying at all times. What does all times mean? All times. In the spirit, with all prayer, all kinds of prayer. Prayers of thanksgiving. Lord, this is what I need. Prayers of thanksgiving. Prayers of supplication. Um, passionate prayers. List prayers, you name it. All kinds of prayers. We're communicating. Listen, everybody. No relationship on earth can function without prayer. Often we treat prayer, we talk about prayer all the time. But you know what we treat prayer like a lot of times? Ever go to a baseball game? What do they do before the baseball game? They sing the national anthem. Let's get that over with so we can play ball. Right? Uh, uh, Lord, how about before we eat? Lord Jesus, rubber dub dub thanks for the rub. Boom. And I want to eat. So we, we go through the preliminaries just to do it. No, friends, it is the main act that we do. We pray continuously, nonstop. What? Are we supposed to get a little oriental rug and face Mecca all day? No, that's the wrong religion. No, we pray to Jesus Christ. You see, praying at all times in what? In the spirit with all prayers and supplications. All kind, being specific about what you're praying for. To that end, keep alert with all the perseverance. Keep alert with all, the, with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. And also for me, the Apostle Paul says, would you please pray for me? Which we're going to get to in a few moments. Okay, let's get back to this. Prayer must be central in all that we do. Pray first, not last. God, I want to pray. I want to put you first. What does it mean to pray first? How do you keep central? Well, what you do is you pray before, you pray during, and you pray after. Praying at all times in the Spirit. All times. What does that mean? Well, the Word of God says, pray without ceasing. How is that possible? Well, obviously, there's all kinds of prayers, but what we're doing is we're staying in a consciousness that God is with you wherever you go. I will never leave you or I forsake you. So I'm not going to hang up the phone. I'm not going to call end. I'm going to leave it in walkie, talkie mode. I'm a walkie and I'm a talkie, and I'm going to talk to God throughout the day. When I was teaching my daughter to drive, Jesus, I kid you not. Lord! <laughs> She's not here, is she? Okay. <laughs> Cry out his name when you're in an airplane. Jesus! <laughs> right? So we want, we want to have a God consciousness. That, and listen, what would happen if all through the day we would keep God in our center of our... I can't do that. Imagine what kind of day we would have. I wish I'd say I had this mastered. 
Sometimes I do really, really well with it. Other times I don't. Just keep in, Lord, you're with me right now. Lord, you're with me right now. Father, thank you with me right now. I'm driving the car. I'm having an ice cream. I'm, God's with me no matter what I'm going through. Thank you, God, you're with me. And to be continually praying and seeing, and it's a great place to be. Why? Because now you know what you're supposed to do. Listen, if you can obey him in the small, you can obey him in the tall. So practicing his presence is very important. The Bible says Jesus did nothing unless he saw the Father doing it. So he was always in communication. It doesn't mean you're always like this. No, you're walking around and you're listening to the Spirit of God. You're driving in the car with the Holy Spirit. He's with you. He's a passenger with you. You're listening to what he has to say. Does that make sense? You got it, everybody? I know it, what a wonderful place to be, staying in his presence. So prayer must be central, and you can't pray like you ought to pray unless you know the word. You know, I remember being a kid, and uh, I remember playing with fire. <laughs> and we, we'd sit in there in a campfire. We'd throw a hairspray in there, and boom, right? Or uh, how about this? Before I learned how to make a fire, we'd throw a newspaper. It was really impressive. Was like, <clears throat> great fire, and then it would just die out. We put wet wood on there. Nothing, it's hard to start a fire. I always wonder, how do forest fires begin? I cannot start a fire if my life depended upon it. Right? But let me share something about fire. Fire, what do you need for fire? You need what? Seasoned wood. Seasoned wood. If you put wet wood on there, it's not going to do very well. So you have to cut the wood. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you read the word of God, what you're doing is you're getting wood. Your wood, it's the fuel. So you cut the wood and you let it season. And then you throw it in the fire of your prayers and it ignites. But you can't live on yesterday's word. You need a word every day. That's why it's important, my, my friends, that you and I get in the word. Get the word. Thy word have I hid in thy heart that I would not sin against you. I want to get God's word in me. And take the word and you put it in the fire of the spirit and you have the wind of the Holy Spirit that will oxygenate it and your spirit is, is burning the wood. Now, I've heard it said this way, if all you do is pray, you'll blow up, right? I'm also arrogant. If all you do is read the Bible, you'll dry up. But if you pray and read the Bible, you'll grow up. I'm telling you, everybody, I've had people pray crazy, insane prayers. Stop praying. I don't want you to pray for me. They're praying things that are wrong because they don't know the word of God. When you know the word of God, you put the pride, otherwise you'll be burning strange fire with your prayers. God, you know you want me happy, and I'm not happy with him or her, so I'm going to lose my husband. God, Lord, thank you. I pray you give me happy. That's not the word of God. Lord God, I pray you. No, that's not the word of God. You need to pray the word of God. Not strange fire. Not your passions. What is the word of God? When you pray the word of God, it's powerful. In fact, Jesus prayed the word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written. The disciples in Acts chapter four were being uh, were in, locked up and were in trouble and they got back together after they were beaten. The, the church got together. They joined together. They prayed together. And they said, Father, to behold, uh, Stretch out your hands for signs and wonders. And then they quoted the Old Testament, how the nations rage. The believers got together. They quoted the Old Testament together. And the Bible says the place, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and God shook them with an earthquake. And they went out with boldness. You and I need to get together and pray for our families, for our towns. We don't have to give up on our families. It isn't just what's going to be. God has us as active participants in what he does on earth, but we're called to pray individually and we're called to pray corporately together. But you need to pray the word of God. And the only way you know the word of God is to have good doctrine. Doctrine is understanding the word. Well, I don't even know where to begin. We'll talk about that. So do you have good wood? Or is it wet wood? What's wet wood? Unseasoned wood. You're just you're giving it with someone else. You know, let me say something else as well. You cannot live on church only. Listen, if, if, imagine if you will, if you work in a restaurant, and that's the only place you work, imagine it, you sit down, but you never eat for yourself. You eat off someone's plate. Can I have the leftovers? And that's all you do. 
are you going to have a well-balanced meal if you're eating someone else's leftovers? No. How do you get healthy? You have to prepare your own plate. And some of us, all we do, we come to church, you hear a sermon, you put on K-Love, whatever, and you have some leftovers. God wants you to prepare your own plate. I'm telling you, nothing got me more bitter than being in the ministry without being with Jesus. Let me say, when I get a bad attitude towards the church and I get irritated with people, it's usually because I'm not spending time with God. I'm spending more time in the ministry. My father told me when I got married, don't put the ministry first. The ministry is not God. God is God. Wow. You see me, everybody? Seek first the kingdom of God. God first. And so that's what we need to do. You cannot pray like you ought to and pray unless you know the word. Do you know the word? How do I start? Start small. Start with the New Testament. Start in the book of John. Go slow. We want to help you to understand how to read the word of God. You see, the Bible says praying at what? All times in the what? In the spirit. What does that mean in the spirit? When you gave your life to Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. But there's also something we can ask for the infilling or the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, he's going to get into it. Listen, stop listening to all the controversies. It's in the Bible. Pray that God would fill you with power from on high. Jesus said, if anyone wants the Spirit, let him ask, and God will freely give it to him or her. So we pray for the Spirit of God. We don't have time today to go through it, but in our, in our freedom group, we go through it. And also, we're going to have opportunities on different workshops to help you to get filled with the Holy Spirit. If you want to, we'll pray for you after the service. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. What does that mean? Well, the Bible says in Romans 8, 26. I want to show you how this works a little bit. The Bible also says in the book of Jude, building yourself up in the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, chapter 12, and chapter 14. He says, I pray and I build up my own man in my spirit. I pray with the spirit and I pray with understanding. So likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. Why? For we do not know what to pray. You ever get that at a point? God, I don't know what to pray. But the spirit himself intercedes for us with what? Groanings. God, I don't know. Sometimes there's been situations in the last couple of months I didn't know what to pray. But Lord, I began to pray in my spiritual language. It's, it built me up. And the Spirit of God knows how to pray for me. So I began to pray in my spiritual language. It doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. It's a tool, right? It's something that God gives us. So the Spirit of God begins to intercede for me. We're groaning's too deep for words. Sometimes I don't know what to say, God. And there are times I'll pray with understanding and I'll pray in the spirit. I'll pray with understanding, I'll pray in the spirit. Now in a public gathering, obviously we need to be know what we're talking about. But there are times for that. And when he searches the hearts, knows what's in the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So notice what this is about, right? with groanings and the Spirit of God. And there's times I'll be praying, and while I'm praying for somebody, God will give me pictures, words, and I'll pray for someone. I said, how did you know that? I don't know. I was just listening to the Holy Spirit. And I was praying with understanding. I was praying what I was hearing. I was praying about pictures I was seeing. Whatever how God speaks to you, you begin to pray. And you're going to make sure that it's the Word, that you're praying the Word, that it agrees with the Word. It is not contrary to the Word. So the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You see that, everybody? Verse 26, verse 27. Now, verse 28, we all know. But we disconnect it from the 26 and 27. Conjunction, and. And we know that those who love God, based upon what? Likewise, the Spirit helps us. He intercedes with groanings, right? And what do we do? Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know for those who love God, all things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. So what I do, that promise is based upon a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Do you see that, everybody? You see, I, I, I want to pray the will of God in my life. And so, God, I don't know why this has happened, but your word says you work all things together for good. God does not cause those things to happen, but he can take your... He can take your tragedy and turn it into a triumph. He can take your trash and turn it into a treasure. 
He can turn your stumbling stone into a stepping stone. God is the God of new beginnings. And how this works is you have to be in the Spirit. Does that make sense, everybody? Praying in the Spirit. Obviously, we're not going to be able to pack all the spiritual gifts right now. We're going to get into that in a new year or this year. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints. So here's the end of, of, of Ephesians with a couple more verses. Praying at what? In the Spirit. In the Spirit, not by yourself. With the Word of God. With all prayer and supplication, right? To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for what? All the saints. You're supposed to pray for each other. Now, I'm going to show you something. Some of you are having a hard time. We mentioned last week that sometimes you have to flee, right, in temptation. Some of you, you just can't get over your, what you're going through. We all have something. In our, everyone in this room has something they're struggling with. If you don't think so, that's what you're struggling with. You think you have no problems. If you're married, ask your spouse. They'll tell you heartily, okay? And also for me, what does Paul say? Praying at all times, making supplication for all the saints. And what does he say? And also for me. Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. Hello. The Apostle Paul is asking for prayer. Jesus asked for prayer. He asked his disciples to come with them. Come, watch and pray with me that you may not fall into temptation. If the Apostle Paul, who wrote a third of the New Testament, found it necessary for people to pray for him, do you think maybe you and I need to ask people to pray for us? Maybe the reason you can't get over what you're getting over is because you have no one to join in prayer with you. You need someone to lock with you, to walk together with you, take your sword, of fe- uh, take your sword and march together. Sometimes there's some areas of your life you need to inter- intercede. You need to get someone else to pray for you. That we're going to pray prayers of faith. You're going to pray the word. Right? So also for me, and also for me, that my words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. The apostle Paul says, listen, I want to speak the right way. I need your prayers. Folks, I need your prayers. I'm praying for you. I can't pray for all of you. I pray for the church and God will drop you in my heart and my mind. I'll pray for you. But you need someone to pray with you. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for our families. It's not existentialism. It's not what will be what will be. No, you and I have an active role in what's happening. And the enemy is trying to fool you that your prayers don't matter. Your prayers do matter. We're to pray without ceasing. We're to pray the word of God. We're to pray by the power and the work of the Holy Spirit with other believers. The Bible says in Psalm 133 how blessed it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. It is there that God commands his blessings. We need to be praying for each other. And so maybe you can't get over your sin, you're in, in adultery, or whatever you're going through, or anxiety, or depression, or you're struggling with finances, or whatever it is, habitual sins. You can't control your weight. You can't control your thought life. Maybe you need to call someone. Will you pray for me? Get people to pray with you. Battle with you. Don't do it alone. The apostle Paul needed it. Jesus needed it. The mighty are the prayers of a righteous man. They availeth much. We need to pray for each other. So as we conclude today, what do we got to do? I am the vine, Jesus. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he's the one that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Are we connected to Jesus? Are we connected to his body? I want to encourage you, this final piece of the armor, I want to encourage you to pray on the armor of God. I want you to pray on the armor. I encourage you, this, can you do this week, a little homework assignment? I'm not going to check you, but try it for a week. Open Hebrews chapter 6. Pray. Lord, I put on the belt of truth. Lord, I put on the breastplate of righteousness. Lord, I wear the gospel of peace. I put on the helmet of salvation. I draw the sword of the Spirit. And I pray, Father. And you just lo- get yourself ready for battle. That you can stand against the schemes of the enemy. Individually and corporately. We're not called to do it alone. Jesus always sent his disciples out two by two. You need somebody else who loves God 
who knows God to pray with you. Guys, we can overcome by the word of his testimony and the blood of the lamb. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I don't know if I was able to communicate your word. I'm trying the best I can, Lord. I just thank you. Your word would do its own work. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that we would be fit for battle. Father, I pray we would wear all of our spiritual armor in Jesus' name. Father, I declare in Jesus' name that we'd have victory in you. Father, I pray we'd be people of, of the word, people of faith. Father, that we would march together, that we would lift each other up in prayer, that we'd stand together. Lord, that we'd see adversities fall. We'd see marriages healed. Businesses started. All sorts of things would be changed because we're working together. Healing in the body, healing in the mind, healing in finances, healing in relationships. Father, that we'd even see our communities changed because we are doing our part in work and in the community in Jesus' name.